Hey, good morning and welcome to this week's edition of Encompass Live. I am your host, Krista Burns, here at the Nebraska Library Commission. Uh, Encompass Live is the Commission's weekly online event. We are a webinar, um, an online show, a webcast, whatever you want to call us. Um, we're here live online every Wednesday morning at 10 a.m. Central Time. But if you are unable to join us on Wednesday mornings, that's okay. We do record the show every week, so you can always go to our website, which I will show at the end of today's um, session, um, and see our archive so shows. We post our recordings to YouTube. If any of our presenters or speakers have any slides, as Jonathan does have here, um, but we post them to online or share them somewhere. And any links or websites that are mentioned, we collect. I collect those throughout the show as well and post them in a collection in our delicious account. So if you can't join us on Wednesday mornings, check out our website. We've got all of our recordings that are going back to the very first one, which was in January 2009. So um, everything is up there if you want to um, see them. We do a mixture of things here on the show, um, book reviews, mini training sessions, presentations, demos of software and, and equipment. Um, basically, our only criteria is that something is library related um, and any types of libraries. Um, here in Nebraska, we're the Nebraska Library Commission. We are the state agency for all types of libraries. So um, public, academic, uh, special, um, museums, even anything that's a library, um, we would have something on our show for you. Uh, sometimes we have Nebraska Library Commission staff that come on and do sessions uh, specific to programs and services that we offer here at the Commission, but we also bring in guest speakers, and that is what we have this morning on the line is Jonathan Smith, who is currently at um, Sonoma State University, uh, way on the West Coast in California, Director um, for Library Technology out there. Hi, Jonathan. Good morning. Good morning. Yep. Yeah. And um, he's up our early, a couple hours before us, um, to join us from his, um, from out there. So thank you so much for get for waking up early um, to join us. We sometimes even have attendees that come in from the West Coast. I know. <laughs> um, and uh, Jonathan was previously at uh, California State University. Um, and had worked there with um, their makerspace. And last month I attended a conference up in St. Paul, Minnesota, the Library Technology Conference, and I saw him do this presentation there. Um, and I just want to say, if, um, if you do ever have a chance to get to the Library Technology Conference in St. Paul, I highly recommend it. Uh, it's a Midwest uh, focused, well, it's, it's in the upper Midwest, obviously. Um, and it's it's a small conference. I think they're max 500 or so attendees, um, but really good. Um, anything library and technology related um, happens up at this conference. So it's every spring. As like I said, it was last March, um, last month <laughs> um, in March. So um, whenever that does open up for next year, I definitely recommend attending it. I think I'm going to keep going to it now. Um, but this is my first one. And um, like I said, I saw Jonathan do this, and I said, this is a great view. I mean, we've seen a lot of things about makerspaces, obviously, in libraries, and um, lots of things about schools and public libraries. And I know I've seen people asking about, well, what about at the academic level? What about universities? And that's what we have here today. <laughs> so um, I'll just hand over to you, Jonathan, to go ahead and take it away and tell us about what you did in your makerspace. Great, great. Thank you. Yeah, I and I have to concur about the, the Library Technology Conference as well. Um, that was my first time attending, and it was really fantastic, so I'm going to try and get back there next year again. Mm -hmm. um, but good morning, everybody. I, uh, As Krista mentioned, I'm currently at Sonoma State University. I actually just started there last month. Um, I'll be speaking about a project that I did at California State University San Bernardino, um, establishing their makerspace. Uh, or what we call the Innovation Lab, but it's essentially a technology-focused makerspace. And of course, I'll be speaking from you know my perspective, which is um, a university library. But uh, really, when it comes to makerspaces, I think that um, it's there's a lot of common ground, uh, regardless of the type of library or even community makerspaces that you may be talking about. So I'll be talking about that project that I started there, and actually, I've recently begun a very similar project at, at Sonoma as well. Uh, so the, what I've decided, I, um, the best way to kind of go through this is I'd like to take you through the process of um, how I implemented this makerspace last year. Um, we actually just launched it in the fall of um, last year, fall of 2015, 
And so we've spent the previous six months um, preparing for that. Launched in the fall of 2015, and I'll take you through that process of how I planned, actually got it up and running, um, what it took to keep the place running, and then that last word, which is a little scary, uh, assessment, as we start to think about whether we're reaching our goals or, um, you know, if we're actually accomplishing what we set out to do. This picture on the slide here um, is kind of fun. Uh, in our makerspace area, we used whiteboard paint on one of the walls, and we just leave the markers out for the students to write down their notes or their, you know, talk about the projects that they're working on. And it's pretty fun to see what type of graffiti that I'll uh, walk in in the morning and you know walk in on this particular one. Of course, you can see Winnie the Pooh there, and it says, "Take your first steps towards fun, creativity, and more." And the honey pot there says innovation. And I was just so thrilled to walk in and see that a student had done this, you know, on their own without any prompting from me. Oh, that just made me very happy. So we're going to start off with planning, because of course, any time you launch into a project, you want to uh, to plan for that. Um, and while makerspaces are, you know, they're kind of new and they're exciting, um, it's kind of nice not to be on the actual bleeding edge of that anymore. So there are plenty of universities and other libraries and community centers who have actually done some of this. So I have been watching this trend for a little while myself, um, attending a few different conferences. Um, South by Southwest Interactive is one that I really enjoy to kind of get outside the box and see, you know, look for new ideas and that sort of thing. Um, but in particular, once I started thinking about, well, could I actually do this at my university, um, I started to look for similar, you know, situations or cases out there. University of Nevada, Reno, their science libraries have been kind of at the forefront of maker spaces in university libraries, so they're definitely worth looking up. And then St. Petersburg College um, in Florida was actually very inspirational to me uh, because when I first began this project, I did not have a budget or space or staff to do this with. And um, they started with um, almost nothing. They started very, very small. And I kept an eye on them and seeing the, the success that they had beginning very small and just kind of building on what they had was you know, very inspirational to me. And I decided, you know what, maybe I actually can do this at uh, Cal State San Bernardino. And then I do mention one other university there as well. San Diego State. So I had a sister institution just like an hour and a half down the road who had um, just recently started doing 3D printing. So I was actually able to go visit and I ended up stealing quite a few of their policies, uh, which I'll be sharing with you later. So looking at you know similar cases uh, to uh, what your situation may be can certainly be very helpful. Um, and of course being able to steal ideas and remix them, I mean that goes right into the spirit of what a makerspace is all about. We're all about sharing and, and building on those ideas. Um, the, uh, the big aha moment for me though came when I attended a maker fair. Now maker fairs aren't, they're not everywhere across the country, but if you ever do have the opportunity to attend one, I highly, highly recommend it. Um, it's just so inspirational seeing what's out there. And really this kind of goes along with the little soapbox that I have um, in that I don't know what, you know, everybody's conference or travel budgets are, but really one of my soapboxes is to, you know, kind of get outside of the library box, see, you know, go look for inspirational ideas uh, elsewhere. I mean, library conferences are fantastic. Krista and I had just mentioned, you know, how great library technology conference uh, in St. Paul was, um, but it's really exciting to see what other people in other industries are doing, and you can take all sorts of good ideas and inspiration from that. Um, and then the other thing, too, that I really got to mention in here, too, stakeholders. It kind of goes without saying that, you know, anytime you start talking about a project, yeah, we need to talk to our stakeholders, blah, blah, blah. Um, but no, actually, this is, like, really critical to the success of your makerspace, is really getting those stakeholders involved. Um, a makerspace really is, it's, you'll find even at the, the university, it's community-driven. It's success will depend on you know the participation of the students and the faculty there, and they'll they will drive the events and the activities and the learning that takes place in your makerspace. Um, so it's really about getting those stakeholders involved at a very like very early point. And then also, if you're like me, you didn't you don't have any experience with makerspaces um, coming into this. 
So you may not necessarily know what people will be looking for in this. Um, I had no idea. I would not have thought to bring an oscilloscope into our makerspace, but I had some engineering students say, hey, it'd be really great if we could use that. I thought, okay, you know, we'll get an oscilloscope. That's, that's cool. Um, so you'll get all kinds of ideas. And then the other side of that as well is that this is where it's, you're already starting your marketing before you even have anything to market at this point. So if you're talking to students, um, I was meeting with several different student groups. I started with the computer science students since that seemed like the obvious easy buy-in um, computer science club and I, our, our IEEE chapter. Um, and I would meet with those students a few times, kind of talk up the idea of what a makerspace is because most of them had never even heard of the thing. Um, they may have, may have heard of 3D printing, but that was about as far as it went. So talk up my idea, and then they started to get excited about it. And before we even opened, they were coming into the library asking, hey, so when is the innovation lab going to open? Um, so your, your marketing starts there as well. Space, obviously, is very important. Um, where are you going to put this thing? I was fortunate that I was able to get some really prime real estate dedicated uh, for my innovation lab. Um, mine ended up being placed right on the first floor, just around the corner from the uh, research desk, the information desk, um, or reference desk, as you may call it, I guess. Um, and so that's, you know, prime location for foot traffic. Students happen to wander by. Um, it may be that you don't have any space. You know, there is, you can try doing, like, pop-up maker spaces. Some people are doing that. You may have a you know, 3D printer and some other equipment on a uh, rolling cart that you can stick in a closet and then roll it out into some general area to use. Um, but having that dedicated space really is uh, pretty fantastic and very useful. So think about uh, where you place it. Um, sticking it in the corner of the fifth floor where nobody ever goes, you know, probably isn't going to help you out a whole lot. Um, as I said, a lot of, at least in my case, and I assume this would be common, a lot of students have never even heard the term makerspace before. Um, so they really have no idea what it is. And I, I can't even tell you how many times I've seen students walk by our room, glance in the door, and then a second later they walk backwards and stick their head inside the door. You know, what, what kind of crazy stuff is going on in there? Um, and then we pulled in so many people that way, um, just being able to actually see it. It's like you can understand the concept of 3D printing. Okay, so you melt some plastic, you built it up, but until you actually see it in person, that's you know that's really a whole different ballgame. So having it in a place where people can see, um, a few other things to think about will affect the type of equipment that you choose. Um, ventilation will matter or may matter. Um, in my case, I'm in an older building, and we weren't able to you know upgrade or change the ventilation in the room. So that affected the type of filament or the, the plastic that I chose for the 3D printers. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about 3D printers. Um, but ventilation will, you know, can affect what type of stuff. If you decide to get a um, laser engraver, that will probably need, you know, some really good ventilation. If you want to think about soldering, you know, there are some ways to get around that. But, you know, a HUD, again, could come in really handy. But I had no ventilation, so that was one constraint out of my space. Noise matters, too, because it can get pretty noisy in there. Not just the people talking to each other and being busy and having fun and learning, but also the equipment um, can be pretty noisy depending on what you get. Networking, um, by that, you know, lots of wireless, because everybody's going to bring in their laptops to work on their laptops. Lots of electrical outlets, um, which, are, you know, so it seems to be a problem, problem all, over, all over the place in the library. But really, make sure you have plenty of electrical outlets in your makerspace. And then just some workspace. I had a bunch of tables that were able to just kind of leave empty so students can sit down with their projects and start working on it there, and they can make their own space. Uh, in my case, I didn't buy any new furniture. I just kind of went with what was in there because, to be honest, I didn't really know what, <laughs> what was going to work best. Um, I ended up taking over an old computer lab, and so we just left all the desks in there. I, re I rearranged them and thought, well, let's just kind of see how this works. And just having a bunch of desks in there that are flat tables essentially has been fantastic. That's worked out great. 
so I started to think about where this money was going to come from. As I mentioned, I didn't have a budget. I was kind of fortunate that at my university they make some student fees available through a, an internal granting process. So I started to put this little grant together and think about the philosophy and concept behind my innovation lab. And really what I wanted was to make sure that we had an open laboratory where any students could come and go. This is really the benefit of putting the makerspace in the library. And particularly, I would say, in the central library, not even a branch library. Um, it's there for all of the students to use. It doesn't matter what their background or what their major is or their skill set. Anybody can walk in and use this lab. Um, it may be that some departments or other units on campus have, you know, a 3D printer or that sort of thing, but those end up being locked away in closets or access is very limited. So having it in the central library or is open to all students, this is really what it was all about for me. Right, open lab for all students to come and go, to, you know, regardless of their skill set or discipline. So I put that all together and it was time to actually get this thing, you know, going. Again, I mentioned the grant process. This actually worked out really well for me. I realized I was very fortunate um, that I was able to get, and I'll, I don't mind sharing the number, I was able to get $50,000 to purchase equipment. Um, but don't let that number scare you because I actually, you know, you can start off with a much smaller than that. I felt like I was shooting for the moon with that um, and it just worked out really well. The, uh, so purchasing pitfalls, um, the biggest issue that I've had, probably the most challenging thing about starting this makerspace and maintaining it actually was um, in purchasing all of the equipment. Um, <laughs> and I was totally unprepared for that. So if, if you've tried to purchase any technology um, through your university or probably your city, uh, you know, the bureaucracy can be a little frustrating. <laughs> um, and that ended up being the case here uh, oh, big time because, mm -hmm. because a lot of the... And explaining I'm something sorry, like... No, it's a, I was just thinking and explaining something that, like this to those purchasing people. Right. How do you get right. that whole concept across of what exactly it is? It's not their usual type of things that you, the university people, purchasers or, or accountants are looking at, you, should, you would think. Right, right. And so a lot of this equipment may, that you may want to purchase is coming from a startup or a Kickstarter or some overseas company. That's actually where I had the most problems, trying to purchase stuff direct from China or Germany. Um, my you know, purchasing department was not having it. <laughs> and they took their time getting back to me and that ended up delaying the opening of our lab because it took a couple months to figure out the purchasing and then it took several months for the equipment to come. So, you know, plan ahead, grease those wheels if you need to, try to find stateside vendors, you know, it, at least that would be my, as I do this again at my new university, um, I'm going to make sure I'm buying everything stateside because that'll save me a lot of headache. So, and then, yeah, you know, I do mention take some time to learn your new equipment, but uh, don't take too much time because it would take forever to learn everything. And really, a part of the fun of the makerspace is learning as you go. Um, I ended up learning a lot from my students. I would get the basics down, get the equipment set up, but then they became the experts really fast and they would teach me how to do this, that, or the other thing with the Raspberry Pi, or to fix this problem with the 3D printer. Um, there we go. So getting into some of the equipment, um, 3D printing. Um, 3D printing is at a great place for consumers right now. The market has come down really fast. There are a lot of little startups out there. Um, prices have come down. Good quality printers. I ended up getting Ultimakers, which I have to say I absolutely love. They've been wonderful. Um, I've heard very good things about the lull spot as well. Um, so two very good printers out there. And there are a lot of reviews that you can read on the internet as well as you do your shopping for 3D printers. Um, I mentioned technology here and there's some acronyms. So just to kind of a brief rundown, technology to be aware of, um, FDM versus SLA. So FDM means 
fused deposition modeling. And that's the most common type of consumer desktop 3D printer you'll find out there. That's what those Ultimakers are in the picture. What that does is it takes a string of plastic, they call that string filament, but it takes a string of plastic and it melts the plastic and it kind of squirts it out at what they call an extruder, a little nozzle, onto the build platform. And it builds one layer of your object and the platform moves a little bit or the extruder moves a little bit and it spits out another melted layer of plastic on top of that first layer. And it keeps doing that, building your object up layer by layer until you have your finished plastic object. That's what FDM is. And that's, that's by far the most common way to go. Um, and I would recommend that as the technology of choice, especially for, um, you know, the consumer grade printers, which, you know, costs, you know, one to three to four thousand um, dollars. So that's FDM. I do mention SLA as well. SLA is stereolithography or more commonly maybe known as resin printing. And so what that does is you start with a basin of liquid resin and that 3D printer has a laser that it shoots through the resin um, and where the laser contacts the build point, that's also the focal point of the laser, it cures that resin into a solid shape. And again, it does layer by layer, but in this case it's actually doing it building it um, from the top to the bottom so it pulls the object out of the liquid resin. It looks really cool. It looks like something from a science fiction movie. Um, but that's what SLA is. That I would consider probably more advanced. Um, it can be messy dealing with the resin. It can get all over the place and it's very difficult to deal with. I would highly recommend that if this is your first time that you definitely go with some type of FDM uh, 3D printer. And for the FDM 3D printers, the two most common filament types are ABS and PLA. Um, they're both great. ABS is a type of plastic that Legos are made out of. It's real durable. Um, PLA is a plant-based biodegradable plastic, um, supposedly not quite as durable as ABS. Um, but the thing to be aware of here is that um, melted ABS has, well, some research, there's some research that says that the ABS can put off toxic fumes. So if you're working in your garage where you can open the door and there's a breeze coming through, it's probably no big deal. But in my case, I'm in a room with no ventilation, so that totally ruled out using ABS. I didn't need to poison myself or the students. So we went with PLA, which doesn't put off that toxic fume. Um, it actually doesn't even smell too bad. And that's what we've been printing with, and it's been fantastic, and I'm super happy with it. Yeah, I, I've, I encountered that um, to the, the ABS, this, uh, the smell of that. Here we had a 3D printer that people were trying out, and I couldn't go near it. I was, like, choking from the the smell from that. So right. definitely, and they, I know, and I did look, at, I've looked at stuff about 3D printers. There are, either like you said, the ventilation. If you can get a room that has ventilation, that would be what that ventilation is for, mm -hmm. is for those fumes, Correct. And, and That's some correct. some of these yeah. kit, some of these printer these three printers come with those, or it's an extra kit or piece you can get to put on it to help with the ventilation and help with the smell. So um, definitely pay attention to that when you're looking at them because we didn't do that here, um, and I'm, I'm hoping we're going to be switching to the other kind. <laughs> right. So if you have good ventilation, then you're okay using the, using the ABS, a hood, or some other way of you know making sure there's strong airflow, mm -hmm. but. You know, in my case, I did not have that, so. Yeah. Um, all right, so the equipment. And then the software I mentioned, okay, so a, a, the slicer is the software that prepares the 3D model to be printed before you give it to the 3D printer. So you start with your 3D model, maybe you downloaded it from the internet, or you actually created it yourself in some modeling software, like Tinkercad, which I mentioned there. Um, the slicer preps the model for the printer. It basically just tells the printer, well, it does kind of what it says. It slices that object into a bunch of layers so the nozzle or the print head knows where to move around and how to print that object. Um, Cura is the software that both the Ultimaker and Lulzbox um, and actually a few other printers use. It's open source and it's free to download. Um, and that's what we've been using. It's very user friendly and it's very easy to use. I like it quite a bit. Um, as you start to get a little bit more advanced, you know, 
Tinkercad, different modeling software, um, maybe of interest. Tinkercad is actually a website. It's modeling software that you can use in your browser. So there's no download. I love it because it's very easy to use. Um, and this is what I teach all the students in their very beginning intro to 3D printing workshop. Um, I show them Tinkercad because it's just like it's click and drag with your mouse. You can, it's so intuitive. There are several short tutorials you can take to teach yourself. Um, I highly recommend take, checking it out. And then as you start to get more advanced students, they may want to move on to something more um, complex, but Tinkercad is a great place to start. Oh, another nice thing about Tinkercad is that you can also upload 3D models to it. So you don't necessarily have to start from scratch. You could download a model or find a model somewhere else, upload that model to Tinkercad, and then modify it or fix it or you know, whatever it may be that you want to do. Um, so you need to also think about the policies. Make sure you've got your policies in place before you start allowing people to 3D print. I didn't quite have all my policies done. I had my procedures figured out. I was like, okay, I know that we're not going to charge for printing because we already have this funded. Um, I have the students submit their 3D models through a uh, Google form that I set up on our website. This was actually an idea that I stole from San Diego State and I really liked it. Um, so they fill out a form with their name and you know some other questions that I ask them, like their major and things. And then they submit, they upload their 3D model to a Google Drive account that I have. And then my student assistant or myself will download that model and we'll print it for them on the 3D printer. The main reason I did this was because 3D printing is slow. It takes a long time to print, and I didn't need, you know, didn't want students to have to stand around for hours at a time waiting for their stuff to print. So we print it for them, and then we send them an email when it's done. Um, that's the procedure. But policies, you need to think about, um, think about, you know, weapons. <laughs> I didn't have a policy in place to deal with weapons, and in the first month, I had two cases to deal with. I had one student who wanted to print something that was called the self-defense keychain. And, you know, I thought, oh, yeah, that sounds nice. You know, I'm, you know, definitely about, it was a female student, so I was, yeah, you know, it sounds like a really good thing. I support that. Um, once it printed out I, and I saw it, it was actually something that you kind of slip your, your fingers through, kind of like brass knuckles, if you can imagine that, that had two really sharp spikes coming out of it that you could seriously, you know, cut somebody with. Um, and I realize, oh, maybe it's not a good idea to hand out weapons from our makerspace. <laughs> and I had another student wow. who wanted to print a, um, a model of a weapon from the video game Halo, which may not have been such an issue in itself, except that it had all, all, like, all the parts moved. Um, the, the trigger, the uh, action, I don't know. I, I don't know a whole lot about guns, but all the pieces moved, and that was starting to cross the line for me because I didn't know uh, if it could be modified into some type of actual working weapon. And right. there's a difference <laughs> between up, here's like a statue of it and it's just solid and something right. working, moving, moving components, yes. Right, the moving components. <laughs> yeah. So that was where I ended up just kind of drawing the line and saying, all right, we're just gonna make a blanket policy here of no weapons or nothing that can be construed as a weapon, which I know is super broad, but it you know, makes it safe for me. So that way I can, and then I, you know, I can, you know, make a judgment call. Since I am mediating, you know, all the print jobs that come in, that does make it a little easier for me to, you know, preview them and say whether or not something's okay. Um, but that's something just, you know, you'll have to consider in your particular case how to handle those situations. Um, so people have also asked me about whether I'm concerned about copyright violations. Um, or something else people think about is whether students need to patent their creations. Um, again, this is these are questions for you to kind of you know figure out yourself. My opinion of copyright. Well, I'm sorry. My my opinion of copyright in this particular case of students printing things in a 3D printer. Um, I just uh, my attitude is I you know with the students is just to go for it. You know, print whatever they want. Um, fair use, maybe. You know, as long as they're not trying to start a business of 3D printing, you know, Disney models and then selling them. That's, you know, what, not what we're here for. We're here to learn the 3D printing process and how this all works. So in that case, I just let them print whatever they want. But another policy just thing for you to think about. We also have several 3D scanners. Um, this is something I was very excited about. You could use those 3D scanners to scan an object 
and then print it out on your 3D printer, maybe scan the object, improve it, change it, remix it, print out the result, or take that 3D model and throw it into a video game. Um, personally, I was excited about scanning realia and um, artifacts that we have in our archives and library collection and throwing those into online galleries. There's a lot of really cool things that you can do with 3D scanning. It's something I'm really excited about. However, you do need to be aware that the 3D scanning consumer market environment isn't nearly as well developed as the, the 3D printers. So good scanners do cost quite a bit more money. Um, it's very difficult to find good reviews out there. They just basically don't exist. <laughs> um, there's not a whole lot of information out there on 3D scanners. It seems like it's very niche to particular industries right now, like engineering. Um, but I decided to get into it anyways. And so just a brief uh, kind of um, intro to 3D scanning, some of the technology you'll run into, and these slides, again, you know, I'll be making them available to Krista so that you can download them. Um, but I mentioned common tech there. There are actually a whole lot of different types of 3D scanning technologies and procedures, but these three are the most common that you'll run into. Uh, photogrammetry, what that means is your 3D scanner essentially takes multiple pictures. So you take multiple pictures, the software looks at the images and tries to find common visual structures in those images, and then it puts the model together using those common structures, and you end up with your 3D model. There are some applications you can download for your, your mobile phone, your iPhone or Android or whatever, um, like 123D Catch is one that's free and it's easy to use. This uses a procedure called the photogrammetry. That's what it's doing. So it's taking multiple pictures and it's stitching them together. Um, that's all right. You know, it kind of gives you the, the basic idea of 3D scanning, uh, but you're not going to get very much detail that way, even with the more expensive photogrammetry scanners. Um, the detail's just not there. Another type, type of technology is structured light scanning. Um, and this is, the image on the slide there is of a structured light scanner that I purchased for our lab, our makerspace. And what that does is you see the, the camera on the left and what the object on the right there is actually just a projector. They're both connected to a computer. And what structured light scanning does is it flashes light patterns onto an object, um, black and white patterns of light. And then the software looks at how those patterns are deformed, and it builds your 3D model based off that. Um, and one of the nice things about structured light scanning is that it's actually very fast, um, and you get some really good precision, precision with it. The level of detail is really, really fantastic, I have to say. Um, another, actually, the Microsoft Connect as well, that's the... Uh, the accessory for the Microsoft Xbox. Um, some people have actually built those into 3D scanners, so you can like homebrew your own scanner. That uses the same idea. It also uses structured light scanning, although it's using infrared light instead of visible light. Um, but that's what uh, structured light scanning is. And then the other one you'll run into is uh, laser-based triangulation. So essentially you've got your object in the middle, and then you have two lasers that are offset from each other pointing at that object. And then there's a camera as well that's looking at how the lasers hit the object. Um, and the software, again, looks at where the laser is triangulating, where it, you know, it meets the object, and it builds your 3D model based off of that. Um, and there are some very common desktop models out there that use laser-based triangulation. The uh, Matter and Form is a entry-level 3D scanner, and that uses laser-based triangulation. Um, the picture you see there is of the David SLS that's what I purchased. I have to say I've been absolutely thrilled with it. Um, it's so easy to use, and the level of quality is just really, really fantastic. Um, it's not cheap, however. Um, it runs about five to $6,000. And I think what you're really paying there for there is the software, because that's where the magic really happens. And then the last product I mentioned there, the DOT product, the DPI-8. Um, so you've got your stationary scanners, and in this picture, I have an object sitting on a little turntable, which rotates 30 degrees, it takes a scan, rotates, takes a scan, rotates. Um, there are also handheld scanners out there, and there's some really fancy ones. Um, Arctic Eva comes to mind. That sucker runs like $15,000, $20,000. And the idea with the handheld scanner is that then you can, you just walk around your object, you know, you can scan a car, 
we scan a person, um, that sort of thing. And I, so I bought a, a less, I don't want to say it's cheap, but a less expensive one. That's the dot product. Um, I didn't get a chance to try it out, though, that it arrived right before I left for my new job. Um, but that's what that is in any case. And so I'm going to run a little video here. I hope that you can actually see it in action. I took, I apologize for the camera work because I did this with my cell phone, um, but just to give you an idea, this is my very first scan that I ever did, um, and I was just so thrilled with how well it took out or came out. I just grabbed a multimeter since that's what happened to be sitting next to me. So the video is running now. Hopefully you can see it. Um, yep, it's coming so there's through. the scanner. Good, good, good. And you can see the patterns that were that are flashing on the object. It turned black and white patterns. It showed color. That the color is how it gets the color scan. I'm going to pause it right there. And now I'm looking at the computer screen. And so it's flashing the patterns. The object turns, flashes the patterns. And that's the computer screen is like a live view of the scan as it's happening. Um, and just to explain what you're looking at there, there's some blue lines and some red wiggly lines. When you're setting it up, um, the red wiggly lines are kind of sine waves, and that helps you adjust how bright the light should be and the level of contrast. Um, you want those red lines to be in between the blue lines where it overlays the object. Um, you don't need to remember any of that unless you end up doing this, and then you can, you'll learn, you'll go through the tutorials. But all that just to say how easy this was to do. It took probably about, um, I'm trying to remember now, probably about five or ten minutes to do the complete scan. Um, another couple minutes for post-processing, which is basically there are a couple artifacts that I had to remove, you know, things that scanned, the background that scanned that didn't need to be there. But that part was really easy too. It was just again like click and drag with the mouse over the part that I didn't want, and then I hit delete on my keyboard and that part went away. And then in this next slide, this is the actual, so this is the result of the scan and, oops, I'm sorry about the volume. I don't know if that's coming through or not. I didn't mean to. But in any no, case, no, it's fine. <laughs> good, good, no volume, because that was, yeah, there's some milling going on in the lab and it's real noisy. But you can see the quality, the level of quality there. This is my very first scan. I had no idea what I was doing. Um, you got full color, texture. They call it texture, but that's the color that you can see, the detail. And then the object itself, which I'm rotating around on the screen. So then I could 3D print this if I wanted to, and we have since 3D printed objects that we've scanned. I could, um, you know, throw this into a video game. I just, I was, I'm so excited about that. I could talk about that for a while. Yeah, okay. that was pretty amazing. That is something I know. Like you said, 3D printers are, are pretty well known. People are, you know, seeing those. But the scanning, when I saw you do that, I was like, that is so cool. <laughs> I hope more yeah. places start getting into having that in their libraries. Right, that's awesome. And then, and then seeing the students too as they learn one piece of technology in the lab, and then they start to connect it with other pieces of technology, mm -hmm. you know, from the scatter to the printer, from the scanner to the virtual reality video games, and you know, the, all the different directions they can take it. It's ah, so cool. Um, so another piece of equipment I wa want to mention here: CNC milling. CNC means computer numerical controlled. Um, and this is kind of the opposite process of 3D printing, where 3D printing, printing is additive manufacturing. You're adding material together to build something. CNC takes material away. You have a mill bit, which is like a drill bit inside this machine, and then you put material in there like wood or brass or plastic, and the, the drill bit moves around and it carves out your object, your 3D object from that material. Um, this is a little desktop. CNC mill that we purchased called the other mill, and this was fantastic for learning, you know, the the um, the idea of, of milling, which is something I didn't have any experience with. Normally, you'll run into mills in metal shops or wood shops, and they're big, giant things. Um, they use them at, you know, to build the wings for aircraft and and that sort of thing. Um, but this is a little tiny desktop one, and this one I I chose mainly because it's fully enclosed, and I didn't need to have you know, sawdust or metal filings flying around in the library. So all the stuff stays inside. Um, if you open it, then it, the emergency stop halts the drill bit so that I don't have to worry about students sticking their fingers into the, you know, the bit and getting it chewed up or anything like that. Um, so this is the other mill. Uh, one thing in particular about this other, this particular mill, though, um, is that you do need a Macintosh to run it. 
Um, the 3D printers I was using, they actually don't even need a computer. You just put the model onto an SD card and plug it in. Um, not only does the other mill need a computer plugged in, but it has to be a Mac. There are other options out there as well. Um, the print bed on this is very small as well. It's like five inches by four inches, and it'll only do objects that are about an inch and three quarters deep. But it's been fantastic for learning the milling process. Uh, my computer science students are really excited about making circuit boards on it. You can put a blank circuit board in there. It's essentially a copper, a sheet of copper on a piece of plastic. And then the software will take your circuit board design, translate it so that it can then etch out the pathways. Um, our art students are excited about making um, stamps and molds using this. So lots of neat stuff that you can do at the mill. I do, have, I do have a question. I do have a question for the audience, Jonathan. Actually, going back to the um, the scanner. scanner, yeah. Um, the video there. I know it's it's embedded into the slides you're going to send me. Is that posted yes. online somewhere too, where people could watch it, or is can is that like? It's so yeah. It actually is on YouTube as well. So okay. I can uh, yes, also dig up the um, the link, but I do have it on YouTube. As okay, well. great. So yeah, so we will. Include, someone was asking if they would be a link for it, so they could watch that the the video of of that scanning. <laughs> Sure, sure. No problem. So, <clears throat> electronics, um, little bits. I just want to run down a few of these. Um, little bits are really fantastic. I gotta say, they're they were designed for you know elementary to junior high age students, but the college students will love them. And if you haven't seen little bits before, they're little plastic pieces about maybe one inch square um, that have all sorts of different electronic. You know, each, each bit has one specific task, whether it's some sort of input or output um, or processing. It might be a light sensor, it might be a button or a slide dimmer, um, or it might be LED lights, or this sort of thing, a little motor, an engine. Um, and they connect to each other using magnets. So you don't have to worry about soldering or wires. Um, you're not going to break it by putting it together the wrong way because magnets can only, you know, because of their polarity, they can only want to go one direction. Um, and it's fantastic for anyone to just, they're, they're so approachable. So anybody with, you know, no background in electronics at all can sit down and just start playing with these and creating and seeing what they can come up with. And then for your advanced students, they, they could use these for actual real prototyping of ideas if they wanted to. So little bits, bits are awesome. Arduino, that's definitely for the advanced students. Probably your computer science and engineering students would be into this stuff. Arduino is embedded electronics. So you see an Arduino board there. That's what that looks like. That's like a, that's a basic computer. Um, and then you plug wires into it, and those wires can connect to sensors, um, temperature sensors, light sensors. They can plug into um, LEDs or other outputs. If you wanted to build a robot, this might be what you wanted to use for the brains to control the robot's movements and motors and that sort of thing. Um, that's what Arduino is. And I would recommend looking at the SparkFun Inventors Kit. This is a fantastic place for people to start with Arduino. Um, it has a full color, um, glossy manual with lots of projects in it that kind of take you through step by step. You know, I've never heard of Arduino before. I've never worked with electronics. You know, this is where you plug the wire. This is how you load the software program. Really cool. Raspberry Pi, um, it's act, so Arduino is good for embedded electronics, sensors, motors. Um, Raspberry Pi is a full-blown computer that's about the same size as the Arduino board there. So a little tiny computer. They can actually plug your HDMI monitor into it, a keyboard, a mouse. Um, you can plug in Wi-Fi modules, that sort of thing. So it's a full-blown computer. Raspberry Pis were developed um, with uh, schools in mind. I, I forget which university developed it. Um, but they're like $35. It's a $35 computer, essentially. And then you have to plug in all your accessories. But um, a $35 computer, you can load you know, Linux operating systems on there. Although I understand that I think Microsoft actually has a version that will work run on Raspberry Pi as well. So that's what that is. Um, Breadboarding is something to consider. I, at the moment, we're not doing any soldering in our lab. And so soldering is when you take um, basically some, the solder is some metal that you can melt <laughs> to connect wires and other, you know, electronics permanently. Um, we're not doing any soldering. It's something that we're considering for the future. 
for the moment we're only doing breadboarding. And breadboarding is, the breadboard is a plastic square with a whole bunch of holes in it that you can plug wires into um, and then you can unplug the wires. And what's great about that is that you can prototype, it's not permanent. Students reuse all, these, all the electronics that we have. You know, they're not wasted, that sort of thing. Um, and then there's some good resources that I mentioned, adafruit.com, sparkfun.com. Those are both stores, but they have a ton of tutorials on them as well that kind of explain the process of how to use different electronics um, and then make zine as well. Virtual reality. So if 3D printing is one of our gateway drugs to draw students into our lab, virtual reality is the other one. Um, that's an Oculus DK2. That was a developer's kit. Um, I believe the Oculus Rift, which is a consumer model, has been released now. And I got to say, like 3D printing, until you've actually experienced it, you can understand the concept, but then to actually experience it is just, it's just this, wow, this is so cool. It's you know kind of mind blowing. It's so it's so real. You put on that headset and you put on your headphones and you've got freedom of movement with your head. You're looking around inside this video game or virtual environment that you're in, and the depth perception and that sort of thing is just really really amazing. Um, so the students love this. It's really great to get the students in here. Um, it's actually pretty funny. Some of the students now, they have this one particular um, game that they love, uh, or demo. It's a fairly basic game, but it's a horror game. <laughs> so they'll, they'll bring their friends in who have never done VR before, say, oh, you got to play this game. It's so much fun. They'll put on the headset, put on the headphones, and then out come the cell phones, and they start Snapchatting or videoing you know, their friend's response when they jump up or you know, scream out in terror when they're playing this video game. It's, it's so really they don't fun. warn them what kind of game they're going to show them. <laughs> No, no, they're just, hey, play this game, it's fun. And then it's, you know, it's like a spooky, some, you know, spooky sounds and a monster jumps out kind of kind of video game. Um, nice. It's pretty funny. <laughs> but it's, it's great to see the students do that. So they're, they're taking the first step of VR. Um, what I'm hoping they'll do now, you know, getting them to take that next step will be the challenge. Um, and by next step, I mean actually creating their own virtual environments, um, you know, from scratch um, to start moving around and then playing with. So, but that's VR. Um, all right, so that was a rundown of all the equipment that we're using. You know, we got to we want to think about how to maintain this. As I mentioned, it's an open lab. I'm not charging for any of the consumables, and by that I mostly mean the 3D printing, um, but also some of the smaller electronics, um, the the jumper wires and capacitors and resistors and stuff like that. LEDs, those are so cheap, you know, 10, 15 cents each, that I'm not worried about those being spent or used up. Um, but I, you know, if you don't have a grant like I did, then you'll want to think about that. A lot of labs do charge for 3D printing, um, and there are some formulas you can find out there that you know kind of take into account the amount of plastic that they use and the length of time that they use the 3D printer. Um, and really, since I'm not charging for the material, um, the way that I am limiting 3D printing to make sure everybody gets a shot at it is I'm limiting the length of time that they use the 3D printers. Um, I limit them, right now I'm limiting them to two hours of printing per week unless they attend one of my workshops, so this is incentive to get them to workshop. If they attend a workshop, then I let them use four hours of time per week on one of the 3D printers. Um, my lab is staffed by student assistant um, that I've trained, and you know I do some workshops that frees me up to do consultations or workshops. I don't have to be hanging around in the lab all day long. Um, and I talked about taking that next step with the, the virtual reality. Having a project binder um, comes in really handy. So it's one thing to, ooh, that looks shiny and fun, and let me try that. And so they print their first thing, which is probably a little Pokemon piece. Um, and then what do they do next? You know, so having some sample projects that they can do, you know, ready to go um, for you know, no matter the type of equipment, the electronics or what have you, this comes in really handy as well. Um, and then maintenance as well. Just expect that you're going to be maintaining everything pretty much yourself. Um, although I have to say, maybe I'm just fortunate that I need to knock on wood. I haven't had any real maintenance problems with my equipment. Um, maybe because I purchased really nice. Or I purchased, you know, I purchased a very well-reviewed printer, or several printers, uh, and a nice 3D scanner. But just you know, be prepared that you'll actually be maintaining that equipment yourself. And then how the students use the space. So I've found that, you know, I hate to say build it and they will come, 
but that's actually been my experience. Um, the students love the space. This actually, this really has become the third space for a number of the students at our university. Um, students that were never using the library before are now in the maker space every day. Um, and this is great for drawing in those, you know, hard sciences, engineering, computer science students. Um, but also, it's actually been heavily used by the art students and business students as well. And then seeing that, you know, cross-disciplinary collaboration has just been really fantastic. You know, I had an idea that that might happen, uh, but it really is. Seeing the um, computer science student hook up with the art student because the art student wants to do an interactive display that uses sensors and LED lights, but they don't know the first thing about electronics, so the computer science student is helping them out with that. Um, it's actually happening. And then the peer instruction was not something I thought about, but it happens all the time. The students are teaching each other how to use the equipment and learning from each other. Um, it's, it's been really, really amazing. Um, this is also, also an opportunity to bring staff in. Um, maybe there are staff on campus who have expertise in certain areas, or community members, maybe businesses that are involved in you know, different sciences or engineering. Um, it's a place where the students can interact with them on projects as well. Just a few examples of some class assignments that have come out of this. And this is just making the lab and technology available. Um, there's an art, a ceramics class. And this is something I never would have thought of because I don't have an art background. Um, but I had a ceramics professor come in, see the scanners, and get really excited. So and that's what the picture is right here. So her ceramics class, they, she assigned them a project to build something or make something on the potter's wheel. And then they brought their creations into the lab. We 3D scanned their, their object for them. And then the students are taking that 3D model and they're deforming it and they're deconstructing it in Tinkercad. And they're going to print out the result on the 3D printer and do an art show of their original creation on one side and the deconstructed 3D printed object on the other side. Really awesome. And I totally would not have thought of that. Yeah, this is something I thought, yeah, when you did your presentation, I was like, that is just amazing. Yeah, the different, having the different types of um, disciplines, um, mm -hmm. things you just wouldn't think about, yeah. Right. And those are some really cool things they have on the table there. I was just, I was looking at the designs, <laughs> and they look like, you know, some are like very nice and perfect, and some are just, I'm going to smoosh this into whatever I, weird shape I can, and... Right. It's art. <laughs> some of them are a challenge. Some of them are kind of challenging to scan, but uh, I can see that. Yeah, <laughs> the more you know, intricate and complex ones. Yeah. Right. When you're dealing with with cavities, uh, basically I mean, oh, the scanner yeah. can only scan what it can see. So mm -hmm. sure, you can scan around the sides and you can scan the top and the bottom from all sorts of different angles. Um, but if there is a big hollow opening on the inside, you know, if it can't see that opening, it's not going to come through on the scan. Doesn't know what to do with it. Yeah. Right. So. Yeah, that's been great. All right, assessment. So this. Okay, I do have a question was, before you go on oh, to that last bit. Sure. Um, someone wants to know if you can. But again, was the program that the students used with the virtual reality? Oh yeah, I didn't mention that, did I? Um, so there there are a lot of different demos and video games you can download. Plenty of stuff from for free. Um, since we have an Oculus Oculus Share, um, is like an online community where people upload their virtual you know, creations, you know, virtual environments, video games, demos. And that's mostly what we've been doing. It's just downloading free stuff from Oculus Share to do. And there's some really intricate, fantastic developed games on there for free as well. Um, some video games are shipping now with VR um, capabilities. Mm -hmm. That's where I mentioned Steam VR. Uh, Steam, if you're not aware of that, um, is a video game distribution platform where you can purchase video games and download them. Um, and there are plenty of games now. They have like a whole category for VR-enabled games. And then Unity, Unity is the development software that my students are gonna, going to be using for creating their own virtual environments. So that's the software run down there. Nice, okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. Right, so assessment is something that's kind of difficult to talk about, you know, whether we're meeting our goals or not. Um, and to be frank, I'm not, <laughs> assessment is not my forte. Um, but in my presentations that I've attended on makerspaces, there's not a whole lot of discussion around this. So this is kind of my attempt to get that, con that ball rolling, that conversation started. You know, talk about whether this is just a fun, cool thing to have in the library that's going to go away in a year, 
or you know what's uh, actually coming out of this. Um, it's easy to you know do use statistics. We're librarians. We're really good at use statistics, right? Counting the gate, you know whether equipment's getting using getting used. Um, it can be really interesting to look at demographics. In my case, the demographics I'm interested in are you know what are the majors, what departments are the students or staff coming from, you know who are using our equipment. Um, so that's one thing you can do. But then to talk about student learning outcomes, you know, what kind of skills that they're acquiring, that's, you know, a lot mushier, <laughs> for lack of a better term. You know, how do you assess that? So this SLO that I've listed there, that was something I included in my grant proposal since I had to have student learning outcomes. I couldn't just have a fun idea. Um, but the way that I'm trying to assess this, um, Really, innovation is where I base this around. So, innovation, learning new skills through exploration. Um, one way you could do that is maybe to start a blog to showcase, you know, the student work. You know, I've been kind of taking a photo journal essentially. I'm taking pictures of all the projects that students are working on. So, you know, we can kind of, you know, uh, present these are the neat things that the students are doing in here, and they're not. A lot of them are not assignments. They're projects that they're coming up with their on their own, or they're creating their own um, projects now. And an outcome of that might also be to have, well, not an SLO, but an outcome of that might be to have the students then write up a tutorial to share on Instructables or some other website about this is how you do this cool, you know, make this cool light up interactive display or, or whatever it is that they're trying to accomplish. Um, and so, you know, we're looking for the student's ability to identify problems here um, at, and attempt solutions. And one of the great things also about makerspaces is that it's okay to fail. It's okay to mess up um, because you learn from that. And then we're documenting, you know, their failures and their successes and how they grow from that. It's so it you know goes hand in hand with the makerspace. Um, I did do a kind of a paper check-in sheet for a while. I guess about you know our first month, just. Out of curiosity, I wanted to see who was actually coming into the lab, and in my case, you know, I had 45% of my students were computer science and engineering students coming into the lab. Now, I have to admit that's probably skewed because I spent a lot of time in the planning stage meeting with student groups from computer science and engineering. So I built up, you know, that that interest there, um, and so now it's on me to start reaching out to some of these other majors as well. But, I mean, it's less than half, so I suppose that's not too bad. They're bringing in their friends. People are walking by. They're discovering what we're doing in the lab. Because I have the students fill out a form to submit their 3D models, I can collect all sorts of fun information. And I know the text is really small there, but that's really just to illustrate how much information I'm collecting. Um, I'm not only using this spreadsheet here, this is in Google Docs, as a way to track, you know, what we've printed, where we are in our print jobs, and what plastic color they want to use, and how much time it should take, and how much material we're using, uh, but also what majors they are, the students are, you know, what their, you know, status is if they're an undergraduate student, student graduate student faculty. So I'm collecting all this information, and then I can start collating it. Um, and so here you can see where the 3D print requests are coming from. Um, and this is before this pie chart here represents right before that art class started their big project with the ceramics and stuff. So I imagine the arts have actually picked up quite a bit now and so the, you know other areas of the pie chart are going to shrink. Um, but of course we had that initial interest from computer science. Business is one that kind of surprised me because I did not reach out to them at all, but I've got a lot of business students who are interested in the 3D printers um, to prototype their you know ideas for you know maybe design a product and present that in class. Um, so, good information there as well. Um, and that kind of wraps up the slides that I, that I set up here. A uh, little picture there of our um, whiteboard wall, computer science humor. But, uh, <laughs> yeah, so that's, yeah, that's it. Thank you very much. Um, I don't know if we have any questions that we want to... Awesome. Um, yeah, great. Thank you very much, Jonathan. Yeah, that whiteboard paint, I, until you talked, I had never heard about that. I know that I've seen and heard people do chalkboard paint, paint where you can paint a, an item or a whole wall for your mm -hmm. kids or something but the whiteboard paint sounds like an awesome idea for places that you can't don't have an actual whiteboard to stick up on the wall or do something with right right and it's not yeah. permanent it's just the paint I mean, it's just a paint that you can always yeah, paint over, paint over and do something else yeah um especially when you like you said you were going into a space that was 
the computer lab before. So it wasn't like something right. built for your innovation lab that you were doing. <laughs> Um, so does anybody have any other questions? We did have some that I grabbed throughout the session, as you see. Um, we are a little after 11 o'clock, but um, we don't get cut off here. I'm in charge of my software here, so um, we'll go as long as necessary if anyone does have any questions. Um, we do have some said very, um, really great, lots of good information, and good for thank you for taking us through it step by step, which I think was, sure. um, yeah. And like I said, I, I, we've, you see a lot of things that um, public libraries and you see news articles about, they use a 3D printer to do this and that. Um, and I think a lot of, I've a lot of people have not figured out or thought about how to get it into the academic environment. Um, and it's maker spaces, 3D printing is, as you said, not brand new anymore, which is great. We're not on the cutting edge of it um, where it's some things have been figured out, but still figuring out how to get it into new different places um, right. and how to pull right. that off. Uh, I think and once, the, you know, once yeah. word gets out to the faculty um, that you've got a space like this or this equipment, you may be surprised who will come knocking on your door. Right, um, they might start they building some, about some curriculum it. about it maybe, not right. yet. Actually, you said the actual pro project. One thing I was actually surprised about was when you mentioned that so, that some of the students walking by had that people actually have not heard of makerspaces before. Which right. we think from, from it being so prevalent now and being mentioned all over the place in libraries and, and from us in the library world who work there, that no, there may be people who don't know that this is a thing. Yeah, that was, I was surprised by that. Yeah, I'd have to say most, actually most of the students I've spoken to have no idea what a makerspace is. Hmm. Um, <laughs> they haven't heard the term. Yeah. Um, so, but you know, once you start explaining the idea behind it, uh -huh. you know, they may have heard of 3D printing. 3D printing right. is the one thing that they probably heard about, mm -hmm. but uh, otherwise. Yeah. yeah, and I think that I've noticed also there's been a trend now for many places to not call these makerspaces, like you said, it's innovation lab or a creation right. lab or mm -hmm. um, something like that. Um, oh, one of them that you meant shared, I uh, called it something else. What? Uh, but yeah, that that terminology is something. People don't know what it means when you, say, when, you, when you say it, so making it something more broader. And also something like innovation or just creation, you can bring in things that are not um, just techie. I mean, you've got all the things you mentioned here, all those computer technical things, but some lots of maker spaces, this is just about making anything. Uh, mm -hmm. Go over here and do knitting, go here and, you know, coloring and whatever. I mean, Legos. <laughs> sure. uh, mm -hmm. So they can also, you know, expand it out into those kind of things. Well, it doesn't look like any last-minute urgent questions came in um, while we were chatting. Uh, like I said, I grabbed them as, as we were going, so I got all the ones that people mentioned throughout your session. Um, but I'm sure if you do have any questions, if you want to, you can reach out to Jonathan where he is now at Sonoma. And you said you're going to be working on this now at your new job, trying to start one up there as well? That's right, yeah. yeah we've got right. a, I've got a head start because there are already some 3D printers, but uh, uh -huh. everything else needs to be done. So. <laughs> right. Well, you've got this experience from before. You can you can do it all right. over again. Great. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, thank you very much, Jonathan. Thank you, everyone, for attending. Um, this was awesome. Um, I am going to pull back presenter control now to my screen. There it goes. All right. Um, so, yeah, that will wrap it up for today's show. It ha It is being recorded still, um, and the recording will be posted here. This is our Encompass Live website. Um, you can just, I give the press, the URL on our slides at the beginning, but um, you just Google Encompass Live and um, it'll come up. Luckily, nobody else has called anything they do this yet, so we are the only the results that come up right at the top of your searches. Um, the recording will be posted over here in our archives. Um, let's see, this was last week's where we had, yeah, we had the recording goes to our YouTube channel, presentation into our slide share, so you can view it there. And Jonathan, you'll email me your slides. Yes, and I'll also include uh, the YouTube links. To the yeah, wherever that is, yeah. And then the links into our delicious account um, for people to view any of the um, the services you mentioned, uh, the products, uh, the, the different libraries that you said are doing it. All right, there's something siren going by. Um, I was noticing, let's see if this is working. Delicious was down earlier when I was trying to do it, but I'll get to them. <laughs> so they'll all be posted there in our um, archives. Uh, when they are available, ready, I will send an email out to everyone who attended and everyone who registered so you all know um, where to go when, it, when it's available. 
Um, other than that, I hope you join us for our next week's show, which is Welcome to the Welcome the World to Your Library, creating a multilingual library introduction video. Um, this is a series of videos that was done here at our Lincoln City Libraries, right here in Lincoln, Nebraska. Uh, Catherine Kelly and Katie Murtha were the two staff there that worked on this program, um, another grant-funded thing, just like Jonathan's, <laughs> um, where they were trying to get more non um, English language learners, non non native English speakers. Um, learning about the library and how to use it, what they can do. And so they're going to come on the show next week and tell us how they did that. So definitely register for that and any of our other upcoming shows. I have a few more I'm going to add here. You can see we just got May up. I've got a few th things in process that I need to get in the schedule, so keep an eye on that. Uh, also, if you are a big Facebook user, do uh, please do like us over there. I do post um, notifications about things. Here is um, a reminder of today's show, a little over an hour ago, log in right now for today's show when our recordings are available I post them on here um, so anything you know if you are big on Facebook like us there and you'll get notices about what we're doing um, other than that that wraps it up for this week's show thank you very much for attending and we'll see you next time you're with us on Encompass Live bye-bye bye-bye